New reports coming in about the revolt in Russia over the weekend. The Wall Street Journal is now reporting that Wagner chief Evgeny Prigozhin had originally intended to capture two of Putin's top military leaders as part of his march on Moscow. And when Russian intelligence agents discovered the plot, Prigozhin was forced to move up his timeline. Joining us now for more on the real impact of all of this, former CIA director and former U.S. CENTCOM commander, General David Petraeus. General, thank you for being here. If these details check out, the Prigozhin originally planned to essentially kidnap some uh, of Putin's top military leaders as part, of his, uh, as part of his rebellion. And also what the Time, New York Times is reporting, that a top Russian commander knew of Prigozhin's plans ahead of time. What then do you make of Putin allowing Yevgeny Prigozhin to escape to exile in Belarus? Does it add up? Well, a bit. Uh, keep in mind that the Wagner Group is still a very useful tool in the foreign policy arsenal of the Russian Federation. Uh, in fact, the foreign minister came out yesterday, I believe it was, and said that it will still be active in Mali and Central African Republic and elsewhere in the African continent and Syria and so forth. It has been, again, very helpful uh, to the Russian cause in those areas. And they don't have a replacement for that yet. It's also largely self-financing abroad. We know now that some of the financing for the actions in Russia and in Ukraine uh, were coming from the Russian Federation. But the whole affair is just nothing short of fantastical. It, re it reveals how desperate Prigozhin had to feel. Uh, he knew that his contracts were being cut off, that his soldiers were going to have to sign contracts with the Ministry of Defense, so he was going to lose his army and his Russian source of revenue. Uh, and he was so desperate that he would launch this fantastical uh, expedition, if you will, down the road to Moscow to kidnap the Minister of Defense and the Chief of the General Staff, whom he, he'd been criticizing, of course, uh, publicly for many months. Uh, and then, right before that, of course, he also criticized the overall decision to invade Ukraine and then the way in which the war was being conducted. So really an extraordinary moment. And then Putin, of course, disappears. He was AWOL in the day of this operation. Uh, he took the ride, unlike President Zelensky at the start of the war, uh, this last invasion. Uh, and he has to now reassert himself. He's got to show that he's still firmly in charge. Uh, he does allow Prigozhin again to go to uh, President Lukashenko's and uh, Belarus, uh, where again you'll sort out. But he has an investigation launched against Prigozhin, perhaps as leverage if he needs it at some point in time. And obviously there is an extradition treaty uh, with Belarus. So, again, we'll see how Putin is able to reestablish himself now. But in the meantime, this weakens the Russian forces on the battlefield at a time when it appears that the Ukrainians are starting to grind out uh, some gains, but still early days and still don't know where the main effort is going to be. Well, uh, and I want to ask you on, on all of those fronts. The fact that we haven't seen Prigozhin, though he's said to be in Belarus, uh, does that mean anything to you? No, I think probably he, he's trying to figure out what is his posture going to be going forward. Uh, is he going to start criticizing the Minister of Defense and Chief of the General Staff again? I suspect not for a while at least. I think he realizes how close he came to, uh, again, ending up, uh, you know, poked by an umbrella or falling out of a window. And he still needs to be careful about both of those. Uh, but so, and, and I'm sure that Lukashenko has him a bit under wraps as well. I suspect part of the deal was you keep this guy quiet, uh, keep him under control, and we'll sort out what the future is, keeping in mind, again, that the Wagner Group abroad is a useful tool for Russian foreign policy. I was just handed this because we have just some new reporting coming in, kind of getting to what was going on behind the scenes, General, I want to ask you about. A European intelligence official tells CNN that there were hints that Russian security services or military might have had prior knowledge of the armed rebellion this weekend. And key in this, kind of adding to what we we're talking about off the top, might have wanted it to succeed. I I'm kind of curious, when you, when, kind of, when you hear that, what Putin should do now? I mean, does a military, does another military shakeup amongst the ranks under Putin seem like that could be in the offing right now? Well, I don't think he wants to do this immediately because it will do what Prigozhin had recommended be done, which was to fire the minister and fire the chief of the general staff. That's so I don't point. think he wants to do this in the short term because it would seem to respond to what Prigozhin was, was counseling. 
Uh, but look, he know, he's a student of history. He knows that history is unkind to Russian leaders who lose wars. He's got to try to figure out how to stabilize the front lines in, in the face of this mounting summer offensive by the Ukrainian forces that now have Western tanks and infantry fighting vehicles and additional training and all kinds of other uh, combat support and service support elements. Um, so that's really got to be his focus. Uh, how does he avoid losing this war, uh, noting that the leaders who lost the Russo-Japanese War in World War I uh, did not stick around for very long after that. And there may be people around uh, in the security services and intelligence services who are starting to think, you know, maybe we should consider what might come after Putin. <laughs> Something, a thought that really, I mean, he's been, what, he's, his grip on power has been 23 years? I mean, the th a thought that probably has if, if not crossed the minds of many uh, amongst his ranks for a very long time, if at all. You were in Ukraine last month, and there's been a lot said about the counteroffensive underway in Ukraine so far. Do you have confidence in the Ukrainian counteroffensive? I am cautiously optimistic uh, that the Ukrainian forces are going to do what no force on either side has really done so far, which is to put it all together. Tanks, infantry, artillery, engineers, air defense, drones, electronic warfare, good command and control, logistics that are responsive, and follow-on forces right up behind the lead elements so that when they culminate after 72 or 96 hours, as is typically the case in tough fighting, you can maintain the momentum and they can crack the Russian lines. We just don't know where that will be and I'm not sure the Ukrainians do because what they're doing is conducting probing attacks, reconnaissance and force literally across this 600 mile front. Think of the, the distances here and just how tough it is to put forces in position, set the conditions as they say for the main effort to be launched. And so it's hard to say when that will come we know it's very tough. Again, multiple belts of minefields, obstacles, trenches, defense in depth, and so forth. And the Russians are doing this phase fairly competently. But I do think that at some point in time, the Ukrainians will break through. And hopefully, the morale of the Russians has been damaged a bit by this whole episode as well. Because mm -hmm. Prigozhin has said what a lot of people are thinking, that this is not going well. Uh, it was probably a mistake. And, you know, who wants to be the one who's the last to die for this war that is not going well? The Ukrainians know what they're fighting for. This is their war of independence. The Russians much less certain about that. <clears throat> General David Petraeus, it's always great to have your perspective in, 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 um, on the show. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kate. Good to be with you.